Good morning, everyone. Um, not sure how many we have at the moment, but I hope you've all managed to uh, join us successfully without any technical hitches. Uh, welcome to our webinar, Considerations for Business Exits. Uh, my name is Mark Douglas. I'm going to quickly talk you through um, the structure um, and uh, I'll probably add a little bit of my take on, on today, if I may. Um, so I think we should have about 60 business owners joining us this morning. Um, and for me, I, I just want to kind of underline why I think this is so important. It's such an important subject and consideration for business owners. Um, for those that don't know me, I spent um, 35 years in banking. Um, and one of the things we did very well was with our staff and with clients, um, reminding them of the need to save for a rainy day, the need to save money for your pension, and so on and so forth. Um, however, one of the things that um, when I reflect back that we, we rarely did, if ever, was speaking to our business owners um, and asking them what were their plans and their considerations for their business exits. Um, I don't think it's something that's commonplace. I think it's certainly um, a, a duty of care to do so that was perhaps sometimes ignored um, and certainly not best practice. So for me, it, it's it's a topical subject and it's something that that is really, really needed um, in today's business environment. So I think, I hope you'll find the time um, very useful today. We've got a, a galaxy of stars and um, some, some particularly good um, speakers today. So I, I'll, I will ask you if you can keep your questions either until the end or you'll see the question box on the bottom. We'll endeavor to uh, grasp those and collect those questions uh, and direct them for you at the end. Um, just before I pass on to Tom from uh, Lexington, um, I just want to congratulate whoever it was that chose today of all days for consideration for business exits. Um, we've got the length and breadth of the country, a lot of our want to be uh, elected representatives who may be having a business exit of their own that perhaps they hadn't anticipated. Um, and this time tomorrow, they might want to be joining um, a similar webinar, um, having not thought about their business exits. Um, I'm talking, of course, about our devolved government um, representatives, our local authority um, representatives um, as well. Um, even the uh, crime commissioners are being voted in today. So I think it's hugely relevant. Um, and perhaps the most important of all, and why we can't uh, overrun on today's meeting, timing-wise, um, is that if you're um, if you're a professional rugby player um, of international standard, uh, you may be considering uh, a business exit slightly differently on your selection for the British or Irish Lions, uh, which I think is happening at eleven thirty or twelve o'clock today. So um, yeah, it's it's certainly a day for um, thinking about uh, changing of. Uh, of plans and, and um, asking ourselves, have we done everything we possibly can to secure our futures? So um, that's enough about me. Um, I'm going to go on mute very shortly. Um, I'm going to pass across to Tom Edwards of uh, Lexington uh, Corporate Finance, who is, will be speaking for maybe the next 15 minutes or so. Um, feel free to type away with any questions. And as I said, we'll come back to you uh, with a wrap up at the end. So thank you for joining. Um, and Thomas, if I can pass across to you. Thanks, Mark. That's great. Thanks for that introduction. Um, hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Thomas Edwards, and I'm a director at a corporate finance advisory firm called Lexington Corporate Finance based in uh, based in Cardiff. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit today about considerations for business exits from a corporate finance perspective. So we'll start with, well, look, as a business owner, what are your potential exit routes? Um, there's three main ones. And I think the one that people are probably most aware of is that one there on the left-hand side, that's a trade sale. So that's when you're selling to somebody that could be a larger business in your sector. It could be someone else that is uh, next to your sector. It could be someone considering a form of vertical integration. Um, and that is that is generally the most common exit route for uh, uh, owner-managed businesses. 
Um, typically, that will provide the best financial returns, or it should do in theory for you as a business owner. There's a couple of reasons for that. But one of the main reasons is, look, you, you want to try and hit a strategic trade buyer who's got a gap in its capability um, that, that your business can plug for them. That's where you see real value being driven is where there's this real strategic fit between, between those two businesses. There's lots of other things that goes on there, but you know, immediately when you acquire another business, there's cost synergies you can make by taking out some duplicate costs, for example, which again helps drive value. Um, and there's also cross-selling opportunities. You may have similar customer bases where you can sell one product into another or one service into another and vice versa. Um, although it's probably the, the, offers the, it's the route that offers the best financial returns, it's probably the route that's, that's the most difficult one and comes with the most headaches and bumps in the road. You're relying on lots of things to align for you in terms of timing. Um, and it's not just your own timing, you're looking at the buyer pool's timing as well. So there's internal forces at play, but there's also external forces, what's going on in the external market, which can have an, can have an impact. And that might not be the, the, the wider external market, but it could be sector by sector as well, because we, as we all know, there's, there's different forces at play in, um, in the depth different sectors. If we flip then from a trade sale to the one we've got on the right-hand side there, uh, I'll come back to the one in the middle in a minute. But then you've got the MBO route, um, which again is a, is a really, really common route for business owners to take. And I think actually in light of COVID and what's gone on over the last 12 to 18 months, I think we'll see quite a lot of MBOs happening again as well. Um, they tend to be slightly easier and tends to be less transaction risk, if you like. And the main reason for that is, well, look, buyer and seller are known to each other and they should have known each other for a long, long time. As a business owner, it comes with less risk and probably less caveats because you're selling your business to someone you know really well and who knows your business really well. So when you get into the detailed legal agreements and, and the SPA and things like that, there tends to be um, you know, limited warranties and indemnities that you'll have to give because what you're doing there is you're saying, look, you're, you're selling the business and you're saying everything is true, but the guys you're selling it to should know the business and they may even know the business better than you if you've stepped back from the business and allowed, and, allowed, and allowed them to run it for a period of time. Um, so that, that's a really, really interesting route. Um, a couple of downsides to that MBO route, and there's a couple of different ways you can do it, but predominantly um, in the SME world, they're done on, on debt. So the company will, or the management team will go out and raise debt, which is secured against the existing business. Um, what that means is there's a, there's a limit to the amount of debt a business can raise, which is typically much lower than what the value of the business is. So there's a gap then that you need to plug between how much debt you think you can raise and how much the business is worth. Um, how, how do you plug that gap? Well, the most obvious re way to plug it is there's typically uh, vendor deferred consideration um, that comes into to an MBO transaction, which means you're not gonna get all your cash up front as you would with that trade sale opportunity. We're really lucky in Wales that we've got the Development Bank of Wales um, that's got a remit to fund management succession planning and these type of transactions. And you've got a whole host of other debt funds that sit uh, alongside them as well, as well as the traditional high street banks. So that's the MBO route. And then you've got in the middle, which is almost a halfway house, a parcel exit or cash out. And that could be either with a trade buyer who thinks, well, look, I'll take a strategic stake in this business now with a plan to grow it and buy the rest of it at a certain point in time. Or it could be with a strategic investor, which is typically in the form of private equity. Um, these type of transactions, they're, they're, they're quite common as well. What it does is it allows a shareholder who perhaps isn't quite ready to get off the bus completely and still wants to work within the business and drive it to the next stage of growth. But what it allows you to do is de-risk so you could sell a proportion of your shares, typically a minority stake, somewhere between 10 and 30% to a private equity investor. So you take some cash off the table in exchange for uh, some equity. You bring in an investor who, who's got strategic expertise in your sector to allow you or to help you try and grow that business. So they'll typically have a seat on the board and they'll have experience of doing what you or, or get, getting to where you want to go with your business. Um, there's some downsides to that, that 
you may have been running your business for 20 years on your own or with a, a small team of business partners and your management team and you're in complete control. Well, look, when you, when you sell to private equity, there's all sorts of different dynamics that come into play there. Uh, it'll change the way you operate your business, how you manage your business. Everything just becomes much more formal. Now, look, people sometimes get a little bit scared by private equity, but actually it can be a really, really good thing because it allows you to put in some robust procedures and formalize your business as you look to uh, to grow it over the next three to five years uh, and arrive at a full exit. So those are your typical exit options uh, available to, to you as you guys as owner managers. And then, yeah, if we just jump onto the next slide, we've got 12 key steps that we uh, at Lexington believe are absolutely fundamental to make sure you, 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 you get alignment on probably before you embark on any process. And when I say before, this could be years in advance. So you might be thinking, well, look, I want to sell in five years time as an advisor. And I'm sure Matt and Andrew will echo this later as well. The sooner you get guys like us involved and the sooner you start to plan, the better. Um, look, I, I won't go through each of the 12 steps individually, but I'll pick up on some of the ones that are absolutely key for us as a corporate finance advisor. So you see there, number one, calculate the adjusted and maintainable EBITDA. So EBITDA is a, a proxy for sort of cash profits that the business generates. And that will be in 99% of transactions what a buyer will use to assess value. Um, so it's absolutely key to understand what is the maintainable EBITDA of the business. Your EBITDA might move up and down due to various different things. What a buyer wants to know is what's the maintainable level and that's what they'll use. Um, if we jump into point three, so understand the valuation parameters. What, so that'll be uh, you know, looking at what sector are you in, comparing you to some quoted companies or comparable transactions and coming up with a valuation range that we think is applicable to your business. Again, this will probably come back in some of the things Alex is going to talk about, but that's relevant when you're trying to get to, well, look, what's your ultimate goal out of this? What's, what's the number you want to get to in terms of um, cash proceeds? Um, I think there's one there relevant to Matt is consider any taxation issues in advance. Um, I've got a transaction on the go at the minute that I think is about to wobble because the, that company a few years ago did something tax related. And I think now it's probably going to bring that whole transaction down. And the tax is absolutely fundamental to any successful process. So the sooner you think about, well, are there any taxation issues in my business historically that I need to now go and put right, go and do that straight away. If there's anything that's going to come up during the deal, again, this could be personal or business related, speak to a tax advisor at the earliest opportunity and they, they can work with us and we can come up with, um, come up with a plan to, to get that right and navigate through that. Um, the other side of it is who is the buyer pool? So that's, that's point nine on this. You know, you, you really need to know before you embark on a process, who is that, that niche pool of buyers that are going to give you the best value and drive, um, drive that premium multiple for you? Who is going to be strategic in that pool? Again, that could be trade buyers or again on the private equity route. Look, there's thousands of different private equity firms out, firms out there. Some of them are sort of sector agnostic. Other ones specialize in certain sectors, whether that be industrials or retail, um, e-commerce, manufacturing or whatever it may be, find the right partner. Because look, if you don't find the right partner, the next five years on that journey is probably going to be a bit of a headache. Um, so that's some of the steps we feel are absolutely fundamental to address before you embark on a, on a process. And if we jump forward to the next slide, um, it's about how are you going to drive a premium valuation for your business? And we see that involving three key steps. So we've got earnings, the earnings of the business. That's something that to a large extent, you as an owner manager is in control of. Then you've got the multiple. Again, You've got control over elements of it, but some of it's quite difficult and that obviously be, be sector dependent um, and also dependent on the buyer pool. And then you've got additional value, which I'll come to at the end. And that, that just, that's just about a well-run competitive process. So if you look at the earnings, well, look, your business has done, I don't know, let, let's plug some numbers. Maybe it's done 1 million EBITDA for three consecutive years. But in, um, but in FY20, you had a bit of a jump and you're expecting another jump in FY21. The aim would try to be to sell off a run rate number. So you're getting the benefit of some future earnings that you haven't quite delivered yet, but you've shown some track record that you've been moving there as opposed to selling off 
the, uh, the historical number. So that's the, the earnings element. Then you've got the multiple. The first bit of that is quality of the earnings. How secure is that profitability of your business? So for example, if you just signed a new five-year contract with one of your key customers, well, you know, you could argue that that, that uh, EBITDA you're going to generate is underpinned by that contract. You've got a contractual relationship. You, there's no way your business uh, is going to be knocked off course and not uh, deliver those profits. That helps drive your multiple because your EBITDA is more secure. Then you've got growth opportunities. What other areas can you take the business into or, and, and that you're planning to? And look, you know, buyers look at that with some skepticism sometimes. But if you can show you've got a really good, robust plan in place to hit those markets and it really makes sense, you can sometimes get, uh, get credit on your multiple for that as well. The next one, then you're on to good fit for the buyer. And that's where the strategic fit really comes in. So you've really got to know who are the key buyers for your business. And that's where someone like you know, Lexington can come in and help you with that research. Uh, then the answer, the last block, additional value. That's about cost and sales synergies. What can you immediately do to that profit and loss account to increase the EBITDA number? Can you take duplicate costs out, which people often look at as sort of low hanging fruit? Uh, but it's also the cross selling angle, which is, which is where you can really, really drive it. Um, then you're onto rarity value. The aim here really is to end up in an auction process when you've got three or four interested parties and you can create competitive tension between, between them and play them off against each other in order to drive value. Um, but that, that's really the ultimate aim. And that, that's done by a well-run competitive process and preparation up front where you've really understood who the buyer pool is. Uh, if we jump on to our next slide then. So I think... A question we get asked all the time or question we ask people is, look, you know, what, what's your value aspirations? And um, there's two sides to that. You've got enterprise value, which is the box on your left hand side, which is typically calculated by a multiple applied to your maintainable EBITDA. You've also got then on the right hand side equity value. And this item is in the middle that bridge the two. Um, people always get a little bit confused about which one they're talking about when we're talking about value. And I think when you get to um, Alid's section later, he's got a, um, a bit around what's your number. I think what you're really focusing on there is equity value. So let, let's start with the enterprise value. That's your multiple of EBITDA. So it's that five, six, seven times your 1 million EBITDA gives you the enterprise value. But 99% of deals on, on are done on a cash-free, debt-free basis. And what that means is if you've got some cash on your balance sheet that you've saved up over a period of time, you haven't taken it out through dividends um, for whatever reason, and it's quite, tax, it's quite tax efficient to not do that and leave it in and get it out on an exit, is you can actually add that cash to the enterprise value and take it with you as part of an exit. Um, we've got their cash or, and cash-like items. There's some other cash-like items that could come in there as well that could be refunds you do from HMRC, for example, that are gonna come in uh, a relatively short to mid-term period or is there surplus assets? So occasionally you can get a property um, that's included on there as a cash-like item as well. So you can add in cash-like items. The flip side of that is debt or debt-like items. They will be deducted from the price because as a buyer, they've got to come in and inherit that obligation. So examples of debt-like items, there's some really obvious ones like external bank funding, for example, it could be uh, an invoice discounting or factoring account. Corporation tax is treated as a debt-like item as well, because that's typically a short-term liability that you'll need to pay in a, in, a, in a period of months after an acquisition completes. There's also some other complex ones, which could be deferred income. So if you're a software business and you're getting a load of license fees up front, for example, you've then got to deliver that service over a 12-month period what a buyer may do is they'll say, hang on a minute, you've taken the cash on that. So that's been an uplift to your price, but hang on a minute, I know that I've got to deliver the service. So sometimes deferred income is treated as a debt-like item as well. The debt-like item element is always a tough negotiating point in any transaction. So you've got your enterprise value, add on your cash, take off your debt. That leaves you with the equity value, which is the value attributable to the shareholders of the business, okay? There's also another element um, to equity value, which comes on to the next slide, uh, which again is where as corporate finance advisors, we typically have a lot of, um, 
I was going to say fun, but that's probably not quite the right word, but a lot of discussion with um, both on buy side or sell side around, look, what is the working capital of this business? So what you'll do is, I, I use the analogy, look, if you buy a car uh, or perhaps rent a car from, um, if you're going ho on holiday or whatever, when you drive off the forecourt, you want to make sure it's got enough petrol in the tank to get you to where you're going. The working capital adjustment is all about that. Is there enough working capital in this business to allow the business to trade as it normally would and pay its liabilities as they fall due? So you've got what's called a working capital adjustment that goes in hand in hand with your cash-free, debt-free adjustment. So typically what you'll do is you'll look at the, the, uh, the normalized working capital of a business. So that, that typically in, in majority of cases, you'll do a, a 12 month look back and say, right, what is the average working capital of the business over that 12 months? It's, you're trying to iron out any peaks and troughs you may get at different periods of the year, and you'll come up with a number, okay? Uh, so here, that number, the, the average is 555, 555,000. And you'll compare that then to the actual working capital of the business as at the point of completion. And if the actual working capital is higher, so if you look there in September, the actual working capital was 865. Well, what that means is you're selling the business where you've got surplus working capital. The, 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 as a seller, you get credit for that. Likewise, if you did it in December, there's a deduction the other way. So you're selling at a low point in the cycle. There's, um, there's a deduction for you as a vendor. So that's typically a key point in negotiation as well in terms of working capital. Um, if we move on to the next slide then. So look, what I wanted to give you today was a little bit of a feel around what, what's going on in the market. You can see there Q1 2021, that was the second highest quarter on record for deal volumes. Uh, it's driven by a couple of different things. One of the main ones in the UK certainly was the potential change to capital gains tax. So I think if you go back to January, February, everyone thought was gonna happen in the, in the budget in March. Uh, it, that, that never materialized, but uh, a lot of people were jumping and doing deals probably a bit sooner to try and avoid that. Likewise, there was a lot of private equity activity in, this, in, that, in that quarter as well. Throughout 2020, PE firms who only make money by doing deals, their focus shifted internally, making sure their portfolio companies were, were secure. In 2021, they had loads and loads of dry powder they had to deploy. So it was a really, really interesting time for, um, for both sort of private M&A and private equity transactions as well. And I think we're going to continue to see that over the remainder of this year, certainly until the end of 2021 anyway and, and, and as advisors we're seeing no, uh, no shortage of um, live opportunities and, and likewise we can only echo that private equity um, uh, activity in Q1. We're seeing and speaking to lots of PE firms just saying look have you got some good deals to chuck at us. So look off the back of COVID you could argue perhaps it's not a great time to sell but again there, there's plenty of money flying around uh, in M&A at the moment so uh, on the flip side it's not a bad time. So that's in terms of deal volumes. Another question we always get asked, which comes up on the next slide is, what are the multiples you're seeing in various different sectors? So just wanted to give you a bit of a flavor of what that, that activity has been over the last three years. So this compares enterprise value to EBITDA and then throws out, um, throws out some average or median multiples in various different sectors. So you can see there TMT, Look, that, that's always been a, a really attractive sector. That, that's, we, we've taken some outliers out of this, by the way, so some of, some of the ones at the lower end and some of the ones at the top end to get to the, uh, to get to the median. We can see their TMT average multiples for M&A over the last three years, typically around 10 times. You've then got healthcare. Look, that's always been a really attractive sector in M&A. There's always lots and lots of activity going on. Again, there's a bit of a COVID boost in there, but that, that's around eight times. You then got the consumer sector. I was quite surprised when I saw this that coming out around just over seven. I think the drive to e-commerce is really going to push that up above sort of a 10 and 12 times. I think if we sat here in six months doing this, there'd really, really be uh, that, that blue line would be much further ahead. The, the, that whole e-commerce uh, boom, I think, um, you know, what we're our feedback from private equity in the sector is there's a bit of a sea change there. The other thing that's gone on there, I don't know if you've seen this, but there's been... Um, a few IPOs in, in sort of retail and e-commerce lately as well. So I think one of the key themes we'll see over the next couple of years is, is a return to retail IPOs. You've got some other sectors then that where the multiples are a little bit lower and that, that's traditionally always been the case, but 
sort of financial services. If you've got a if you've got a tech angle to that, I think you're probably looking at maybe closer to nine or ten. But yeah, financial services somewhere around the seven mark. Industrial, so manufacturing, just over six. And then at the bottom end, you've sort of got energies and utilities trading around the five times. Um, but again, look, I think I think you know you cut this at um, perhaps later in the year, they might be um, uh, might tell a bit of a different story. So look, hopefully that gives you a little bit of a flavour of what's going on in the market um, at the moment. Um, and I'll, I'll finish with um, uh, why what, what's the benefit to you as an owner manager to use a corporate finance advisor? Um, I think that you know it, it's a real investment in um, in you know look selling your business. You're probably only going to do it once. You want to make sure you get it right. So I think a CS advisor we can really do the heavy lifting and take the strain from you as owner managers. Look, it's a full time job. So you're trying to run your business and sell it at the same time. It's not really going to work. And one thing's going to suffer. Uh, and the last thing you want to do is when you're in discussions with the buyer is the trading year bit. If you take your eye off the ball on the, on the business and trading dips, because that's going to then have an impact on, on the value. But I think where a CF advisor really adds value is we've got access to a lot of databases and a lot of relationships. We can really identify that strategic buyer pool. I think the second thing people are always a little bit nervous about is confidentiality staff finding out, customers finding out, suppliers finding out. We can do all of that on a confidential basis to ensure that everything's really well managed. We can also act as a sort of go-between between between you and any buyer. If you've got a good relationship with a buyer, which you'll need to to keep sort of post-deal, we can act as as almost a bit of a good cop, bad cop routine where we do the tough negotiating on your behalf. Again, sort of preparing the documentation or marketing documentation, so you'll have an information memorandum or prospectus. We're, we're really experienced in doing that and, and know what they need to look like and know what we need to put in them to hit, um, to really uh, whet the appetite of these buyers. And again, I think the, the bottom one is where we really stand out, is we'll project manage the whole, the whole shooting match for you, right from planning all the way through to completion, liaising with people like Matt and Alid and your legal advisors to make sure everyone's aligned on timings, valuation, negotiation, and, and keep it all on track to complete um, at the date that it may need to complete. Because again, there's also some internal timings or external timings driving it that might, that might mean you need to complete in, um, on a potential uh, day. So look, I hope that's really helpful for everyone. Um, look, if anyone's got any questions, like, like Mark said, please put them in the, in the chat or, um, or keep them to the end. But yeah, thank you very much. I'll now hand you over to Matt Denny, tax partner at Bevan Buckland, to take you through some tax considerations. Thank you, Tom, and thank you also for um, putting some leads into what we're we're going to talk about. Uh, just a little bit about me. So I'm a tax partner at Bevan Buckland. So my day to day is is looking after owners and their and their their businesses on their accounts and tax compliance and advisory needs. But by way of background, uh, in a former life, I worked at one of the, the big four firms, uh, doing doing transactions. Mm-hmm primarily in fact for for private equity purchases but also for for management teams and just just mention that as i would have seen these transactions from both sides pulling out um from what tom has said about um having to get thing your ducks in a row early doors the, the four slides i'm going to go on to are, are very much echoing that that it's it's you know you need to be thinking about these things maybe as many as four years before you do a transaction because at the day of the deal, for some of these things, as we'll come on to see, it's going to be too late. Um, the, the first slide um, is in respect of what we call enterprise management incentive share options. Um, and, and the reason I put this in, and echoing on what Tom said about sometimes the most straightforward deal being a management buyout, because you, you, know, you, you should know the buyers, but to, but to have a management team in place to, to execute a management buyout, you, you need to possibly be thinking about incentivizing them with something like EMI share options. I'm going to go through a little bit of the tax benefits of EMI options for those who are not aware of them, because they are incredibly tax favored and not that complicated to put into place. Uh, the, key, the key benefits are you can grant these options with no upfront tax charge to your to your the management team that you want to grant them to, you can get HMRC to agree the strike price. That's that's the price they will pay when they exercise those options and buy the shares. And it's very likely on small 
um, shareholding. So if, if each has less than 10%, that the revenue will agree a discount of up to 75%. And I'll come on to why that, that might be helpful for when Tom's looking at getting um, funding for a management buyout from DBW or the banks. But I'll, I'll come back to that. From a tax perspective, what you're giving these individuals is um, a capital gains tax um, uh, benefit. So they're, they're effectively commuting what would otherwise be income into capital gains at, at much lower rates. And whilst if business asset disposal relief, uh, our old entrepreneurs relief, if that remains, then we're effectively giving them a 10% rate without the need of them having to own 5% of the shares. And from the, the owner's point of view, because they're options, you're not giving these individuals voting rights. They don't have any voting rights until they exercise the shares. And you can make it a condition of the options that they can't exercise them until an exit event. So they tick a, a lot of boxes. The, the one that's a bit subtle in terms of why you might need to be looking at this is, if you're looking at the, the management buyout route, uh, funders will typically require that team to put some of their, well, I think what we call the sort of put their skin in the game, you know, put some money in. And they can't always raise that personal finance or enough personal finance to satisfy the, uh, the third party lender. The EMI options can give them that leg up. You, you, with that discount, if you give them, if you, you don't have to give them a discount, but if you, if you agree a, a discounted value and you give the options at a discount, you can effectively give the management team a leg up. So when they come to execute a management buyout, they've kind of got some equity, some equity already. Um, so again, something I put this first, because this is probably one of the first things to be looking at if, if you think your exit might be via a management buyout rather than a, a more, more difficult trade sale. This, this, the second slide um, uh, is, a, I call it being deal ready and, and sort of going through due diligence. The first bullet point is non-tax issues. I'm not going to talk about non-tax issues because I don't, I won't you know, deal with them, but you, know, you need to be aware that of course there are non-tax issues that will be covered on a due diligence. But, but Tom mentioned um, how on a particular transaction, a tax has possibly scuppered the, scuppered the transaction. Typically, if there are tax issues, they can be dealt with with a warranty or an indemnity, effectively a bit of a price chip, as I understand it. Um, where we have seen issues are with unsettled tax avoidance schemes. So the and the reason for that is if you're, and there's, there's a lot of them about and there's been opportunities to settle tax avoidance schemes. And if they're still if they're still running along and settled, the issue with them is that quantifying the liability can be very difficult and therefore it can be very difficult to deal with them with the warranties and indemnities. I'm not going into huge detail. What I think the key takeaway on, on tax is, you've got a lot of compliance, which is self-assessment, your corporation tax, your VAT, your pay as you earn, R&D claims, there might be construction industry scheme as well. It's all self-assessment and it's, I would say if you have the scrutiny you get of your tax affairs on a due diligence is tenfold the scrutiny that HMRC generally put onto your tax filings. Now we have a sort of a, 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 a file now check later and quite often there are no inquiries. So the, I think the key thing is when you're, when you're working with your accountant and you're thinking about your tax filings, you're, you've got to be thinking about not necessarily what the revenue might think of them, but what that big four auditor doing a due diligence on your tax filings might think. Um, and that will, I would have thought, make your life easier when you're, when you're going through a deal. Um, the next slide is sort of like moving towards the, the transaction itself. Um, and this is about the, the, the form of considerations. As Tom's alluded to, you're, you're not always going to get cash up front. There's good, there can be a mixture of consideration, um, shares, loan notes, earn out, just, just plain old deferred consideration. And this is where the, the tax advice is absolutely critical because the, the form of the consideration will dictate the rate of tax you pay. Um, 
we have um, what we now call business asset disposal relief and our, our 10% tax rate, albeit it's on a, a £1 million lifetime allowance. Um, but to, to, to get into that, there are things that have to be done in respect of loan notes and deferred consideration. So uh, you, you can normally structure these things with the right tax advice, and you can generally get tax clearances as well. Um, without those clearances, there's always a danger that some of your consideration be taxed as income and not capital gains. And, and what I find is, it's quite terrifying, is that people are so focused on, will I get entrepreneurs relief, business asset disposal relief, will I get the 10% rate? And they're forgetting that before you can get the 10% rate, you have to get into capital gains tax. And there's always a possibility on a badly structured transaction that you'll be an income tax and you'll pay 32.5 or 38.1% of the dividend rate. And those things can be dealt with if things are properly structured and clearances can be obtained from HMRC. Um, all good tax advisors should be able to assist you with that, that sort of thing. The last one is just a, a, a curious one. Um, QCB is what we call qualifying corporate bonds. And they're quite often used as a form of loan note consideration. And capital gains are deferred into these QCBs. And it terrifies me that how many people don't realize that if a QCB goes bad, you know, so it's an unsecured loan note and, and the unfortunate purchaser company fails, the gain that you rolled over into that QCB still crystallizes. You still pay tax on a gain you do not receive. And the only way to, to deal with that problem, and I've seen it done, is to sort of, is to, get that QCB into a charity, if you can find a charity that will take it and they will want some money to do so. Um, there are some pitfalls, they can all be sorted out with, um, with good tax advice. The final slide, um, I mean, you can't talk about tax and, and, and sales without touching on what we now call business asset disposal relief. Um, I've headed up this as checking qualification status and maximizing the lifetime allowances. I, I suppose the key thing is, We've gone from 10 million to 1 million. So the benefit of, of this relief is now effectively 10% uh, of, of 1 million. So the, the, the benefit has, has dramatically reduced. But that would, I suppose, increase the incentive to look at structuring to maximize those allowances. You know, so if, if there's a spouse uh, who doesn't have shares uh, or enough shares to qualify, should that be looked at? If there are children working in the business, should they have shares so that you can double up, treble up, even quadruple up on the, on the 1 million of, of, of qualifying lifetime allowance? Um, these are things that need to be done within, a, within usually more than two years before the transaction because they are there's a qualifying sort of runway for, for these reliefs. Um, my last bit, on the, you'll be glad to hear because I'm aware that tax is, is only interesting to me. Or, or, um, it's not interesting to everybody, is what we call the dilution trap. And this is this happens more often than I would I would have thought, but th there's a number of situations, number of cases where you have to have 5% of the ordinary shares and the votes to qualify for the relief. And but you have to have that 5% on the day of the transaction. And the number of times that things have been reorganized just before the transaction and people have been inadvertently diluted to just below 5%. And they've gone to court and the, the judge has had great sympathy for them and said, I'm very sorry, I've got great sympathy for your position, but those are the rules. And it's cost them well, at, 10, at 1 million, it would have cost them 100,000 for these people. I think it was costing them more like 900,000 pounds. So that's a bit of a run through of tax considerations. The key takeaway is these are things that need to be dealt with as many as four years, ideally before a transaction, because your, your due diligence is generally going to go back at least four years, because that is sort of the disclosure window for HMRC to, to look at past tax filings. Thanks, Ad. Thank you very much. And I'm going to hand over now to, to Aled at, at Niche. Thank you, Aled. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thanks very much for that. So um, I'll run through a little bit uh, about us. First of all, uh, we are an award-winning firm of chartered financial planners based in Newport. 
um, fully fixed fee, which is rare in financial services, particularly in, in, in investment management, et cetera. So um, our clients know exactly what they're paying um, rather than a percentage basis, which is, which is more common in our industry. And we very much focus on financial planning. Uh, we're very fortunate at Niche that um, our chairman and one of my fellow directors um, uh, founded a piece of cash flow software um, called CashCalc, which is a marketing, market uh, leading piece of, of software used by thousands of financial advisors across the UK. So we, we're very much at the forefront of, of financial planning. Um, and I'll show you actually a, a little bit of CashCalc in, in, in a second. Um, I'm a Chartered Financial Planner, a Fellow of the Institute of Securities and Investment and the Personal Finance Society. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about finding your number. Now, uh, as you're nearing a liquidity event or business exit, you know, there's a huge weight on your shoulders uh, to make the right decisions to be, you know, from a legal perspective, from a corporate finance perspective, from an accountancy perspective. And sometimes, you know, the last consideration is then actually, you know, what you need for yourself, you know, what, what is your number? How much, how much do you need to realize from this exit to deliver the lifestyle that you want for the rest of your life and to do the things that you want to do and that, you know, the, the, and, and whether that's, you know, £100,000 a year of expenditure or £50,000 a year of expenditure with lots of capital requirements. So, you know, so there's a huge um, variation that we see, um, but, but, the, but the logic behind it and, and for the finding your number piece uh, remains the same. So what I'm going to do is to run through and show you the, the software itself. So let me just share my screen. This is um, this is an example client that we have we have built um, uh, based on, on 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 a real client. But this is a very uh, a simplified uh, version, and cash flow is effectively money in versus money out. So we know you know the sources of of income etc. And and quite often as you're nearing a business exit, there's also that that concern that that income tap is being switched off. As in, you know, the 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 PAYE and dividend income is now ceasing, and that's an income that you're going to have to generate from 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 the cash that is realised uh, from 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 the sale of the business. Um, so the, the the timeline across the bottom you can see here is just a few examples of, of what this client was looking to do. There was the business sale, and they had two immediate purchases, which was a yacht and a holiday home purchase. Um, we have forecast in this instance to age 96, sometimes we use age 100, sometimes it's 110. Um, obviously agreed with, with, with the client as, we, as we're going through these things. So um, everything in the cash flow will be adjusted for inflation. So investment returns will be adjusted downwards for inflation over, over time to show the, the, the capital value. And any expenditure will be increased in, in line with uh, inflation as, as will uh, income. So in this particular example, um, we go through a lot of granular detail in actually getting to that yearly expenditure figure, um, you know, and, and discussing with clients how much, you know, they want to spend on holidays, what their objectives are, you know, charitable donations, you know, what are the costs for, you know, just your non-discretionary and discretionary costs um, that, um, that need to be met. So, and then we come up with a, with a figure. And for, for this client, for example, it was £140,000 a year of net expenditure, and we included a tax risk in there for, for capital gains tax and some income tax within, within the portfolio as well. They had two purchases. Um, there was a yacht purchase and a holiday home purchase. They're in a fortune position, having already repaid their mortgage. And there were two final salary pensions that we knew, you know, were certain to come in um, because they were guaranteed uh, one at £15,000 a year and one at £7,500 a year. And both clients were entitled to the full state pension. So we know those are the sources of income. And then you've got the, 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 the outgoings as well. Um, so what we do to calculate the number is to create three pots. Now, these pots will be a pessimistic medium and optimistic growth or cautious, um, uh, balanced and aggressive growth. So what we will calculate is the amount of money in today's terms you would need to invest to deliver that lifestyle. So less the, less the income sources that are coming in. So you can see the, the cash flow at the moment 
uh, is running well into the red um, because the that's the cumulative cost of those initial purchases as well as the 140,000 uh, pounds a year of expenditure less the less the income that's coming in. So what we do now is to effectively calculate the value to stop that going into the red. What is the what is the what is the number today that you need to invest? To, to, to meet those, that, that, that income object, objective for the rest of your life. And that is your number. That is the number you need to realize for yourself. If there's surplus above the number, great. There's lots of things you can do, which we'll go on to in a, in, in a second as well. So I will calculate that based on those, based on those four pots. Now, it might seem this is a little bit slow, but this is going through um, tens of thousands of calculations in the background. Um, I hope it doesn't, uh, I hope it doesn't time out because sometimes it does so with, uh, with, with, with bandwidth, but this will, this will give us an indication and this is the starting point of our discussions. And it, what it does to arm you with, with that figure that you know that, okay, you know, well, when I'm exiting this business, I've got enough to do the things that I want to do. And actually the value that I've created in this business has delivered me all the things that I want to do um, in, in life. Sorry, I have to rerun that uh, uh, simulation again. Um, so, and again, it, it, it varies significantly from, from, from client to client. Um, and we've had lots of instances where people have said, oh gosh, you know, if I'd have known I could have done all of this and, 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 and achieved this years ago, then I would have sold my business a few years ago. Or, you know, conversely, um, people might want to hold on to their, their business for a little longer to look for alternative employment or to take on a consultancy role in, in, in the business after, after it's sold. But this, this will allow you to give you all of those options. Okay, so um, the as you can see there, the figure um, at a medium level of growth, which is the figure we go on today, is two point eight five four million. So at five percent um, growth rate, as an assumption, the number required to deliver that one hundred and forty thousand pounds a year of income is uh, two point eight five four million. We will then apply that to the pot which is there as a contribution, a capital injection of 2.854. And you can see that the cash flow is now no longer running into deficit. So that is you know, the, the, the start of our, our discussions. What I also want to describe is a little bit of the difference between um, you know, what, you, what you might have experienced in financial advice and financial planning. So financial planning, I like to give the analogy of, of getting onto an aeroplane. You know, the end is in sight. Um, lots of things change along the way. So the wind, the temperature, um, uh, and with, with financial planning, it's very, very similar. So um, you've got the end in sight, and the end is usually age 100 on a, on, on a cash flow, but lots of things change. You know, health, capital requirements, investment returns, liquidity uh, requirements, um, inflation, lots of things will change along the way. So it's our job as financial planners to guide you through those financial decisions on the changes in legislation and taxation that come uh, along the way as well. And we would work alongside your, you know, your, 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 your accountants. And also, you know, uh, uh, as, as Tom mentioned, the, um, the, 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 giving you this figure arms you to be able to go back to them, to the corporate finance advisor and say, okay, yeah, well, I know that this is now enough. Let's, uh, you know, we're comfortable going ahead with a deal. Um, so back to the airplane analogy, the financial planning, it's, it's what we would do is to guide you along that journey. And the investment is effectively the engine. So, you know, you don't mind if it's Rolls Royce or BAE systems or whoever produced the engine, as long as it's very efficient and it's cost efficient and it gets you there, it's a means to an end. Uh, and it's a very important part, but it's navigating that journey um, that is that, that, that in, in our view is absolutely vital. So I'll run through uh, an example uh, of a cash flow for this client. So this this is after we've actually calculated the number. So the um, savings parts for a general investment account was 3.567 because what we decided with this client, the, the exit was enough for them to be able to build in a 25% buffer for contingency over and above the expenditure we'd built in. So we invested 3.567 million in this instance. And again, it's the same if, if there's one less zero, or one more zero, the logic still, still applies. And then you've got your existing 
uh, if you've got your existing assets as well. On this client, uh, was in the fortunate position that um, future um, uh, 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 considerations that were coming from the, the business exit were surplus to requirements. So the cash flow was very, very positive. So what that allowed um, this client to do is to think about legacy planning, to think about IHT planning, to think about giving money away as well. Okay, so I'll just return back to our slides. Okay, so um, with regards to what we do with that money, we would work with leading investment providers, obviously fully FCA regulated um, and in you know institutional funds, you know HSBC, Vanguard, BlackRock, the biggest and best uh, na names in the industry. And we would create an investment portfolio in line with your attitude to risk, but also very importantly, in line with your income requirements and in line with your, your capital requirements um, and the time horizon of that investment as well. So we have a very straightforward investment approach at, at, at Niche. We, anything needed within the next three years would be held in cash or cash-like. Anything from year four to year eight would be in something that's got volatility management, that's not uh, that, 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 that's got some risk uh, mitigation. And then longer term, all in um, low cost investments that will deliver great returns over time. Um, two, two particular investments, uh, uh, tax efficient investments that are of interest to, to business owners and around access. Now I won't go into the detail on the tax breaks of these, but the, um, the government give significant tax breaks for investment into smaller companies. Um, and you can invest in pooled investments with investment managers that do this. Um, one are enterprise investment schemes and the other venture capital venture capital trusts um you know regularly we can significantly reduce clients income tax liabilities and there's a completely wipe them out sometimes in retirement um reduce capital gains tax um uh, liabilities and also um uh, business property relief now business property relief is something that in most instances you call you would qualify for uh, by holding your business shares but once those shares are sold, the money that comes back is in is, is taxable in your estate for IHT purposes. But it's not until actually you know the amount that you need for yourself, the amount that well, what your number is, can you start to think about those things. So after establishing um, by cash flow the amount uh, required, we can start to talk about um, all the things that you want to do in life um, to you know, whether that was setting the, setting the children up on, in university and the grandchildren or trust funds, et cetera, um, and then reinvesting potentially back into investments that qualify for business property relief because you've got a, a three-year window after the exit to invest back into something that qualifies for business property relief and then it, it, it's immediately outside of your estate for IHT purposes rather than you having to wait um, the usual two years. So again, all this would, would be part of the planning and discussions and all things that you should be considering um, well in advance of the, uh, uh, of the exit. So you know, I'd, I'd echo very much what, uh, what Matt and Tom have said. Um, the best point uh, at, at which to engage a financial planner is as soon as you can, you know, within this journey, because there's lots of considerations that you can make well before um, uh, the exit, uh, and, and then to make sure that you make the right uh, decisions once you've gone through that liquidity event. Um, so I'll now hand back over to Mark, and if there's any questions, uh, we'll be happy to, to run through them. All right, thank you, Alan, and thanks, Mark and Thomas. Um, some questions coming in. Uh, I tried not to have um, any myself, although I did have a few. Um, so, um, Alan, if I can come to you first. Um, I've got kind of two questions, and I'll, I'll wrap them both up. I don't know whether they um, would lead into each other. So the first question is, when is best to engage with a financial planner? Uh, and, and the potentially bigger question what if my number is unachievable okay um well 
the, the, as, as I mentioned uh, a little earlier, the best time to engage a financial planner is as soon as you can um, in this journey. There's so much you can do financial planning wise on, on the journey itself, because sometimes we, we have clients come to us and, and they, they're just very, uh, feeling very stressed. They've gone through the business exit. There's a huge amount sitting in, in, a, in, in a bank account and that, uh, they actually find that just as stressful as all, the, all of the stuff with, with, with the transaction beforehand. Um, so the sooner that you can engage a, a, a financial planner, the better. Now, you know, what if your number isn't achievable? Well, there's lots of things you can do. You can compromise on, 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 on expenditure. Um, you can work for a little bit longer. Um, you can, you know, take a little bit more risk with the investments so that they would achieve more return o- o- over time. So there's lots of things that we can, we can adjust um, if the number was achievable or if it is far higher as in what you do with a surplus so conversely if 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 the figure that you need is far far less than actually what you're going to exit then that also creates a problem because there's a huge amount of surplus there which is all um which is all potentially subject to uh to inheritance tax as well so there's lots of considerations that you can make beforehand but because this is such a busy time there's so many things you know, going through business owners' minds. They've got to, and, and as Tom mentioned, you know, they, they, they've got to run the business, make sure that the business is running efficiently, making sure that, you know, they've got the legals right, they've got the accountancy right, that they've got the corporate finance stuff right, that they've got their own personal stuff right. So, you know, engaging everyone late in the day is, is just amplifying the stress in an already stressful situation. So um, I would say the earlier, and, and that's the same for, 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 for Matt and Tom as well, you know, if, you, if you're coming towards or thinking about it, you know, just have the conversation, pick up the phone, um, and, 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 you know, you can, you can at least then you start dialogue and start to get your ducks in a row in, in readiness. Thank you, Matt. I like that. I mean, personally, for me, I thought that was a great answer, but it's, I like the fact that we take a holistic approach. It's not just about the numbers. It's about the stress and the individual and the the behaviours that sit behind the numbers. So uh, thank you for that. Um, just moving on, uh, we've got one for Thomas. Um, so I'll try and put it into my own words. So I've got a deal to sell my business at the current EBITDA. Um, mm-hmm. Then uh, a new EBITDA arrives, which is lower would the value of the business change and would I have to sell it for less? Okay, good question. Um, without sort of trying to sit on the fence without it too much, it'll all depend on the the, um, the scenario because look, if you've got three or four different buyers in there and, and one or two are saying, well, yeah, actually, I'm going to lower my bid now, but you've got another one that says, well, no, I want it so much, I'll, I'll still pay the same value. Perhaps not. If you're down to one buyer and, and there's material drop in EBITDA, I think it's quite difficult to actually navigate away from, from any reduction. Um, look, you know, as advisors, we'll, we, we do our best to try and negotiate hard on your behalf. But if you're in that scenario, yeah, I think the answer would be yes. You probably would need to take a look at a price chip. Or uh, just a caveat that, if there was an immediate price chip, what you could try and do is build in some sort of earn out so that if you, if you, if you went back up post deal, you could have a bit of a bonus later down the line. All right. Okay. And what if then there was like a, a pending contract that you hadn't yet signed for the next two years of income? I guess you'd bring that to the table then, would you? Yeah, I think what you could do there is, that, again, you try and negotiate it into any deal and get credit for up front. That's going to be very difficult. But I think what, what we've seen is, um, yeah, you, you put something in there that's an earn out. So uh, you get a bonus if you achieve X amount of EBITDA, sort of 12 months or 24 months post deal that then gives you credit if that contract signed post deal. Of course, there's all other sorts of things going on there, Mark, but you want to make sure that if you've got a Brucey bonus coming 12, 24 months down the track, you're still working in the business and you can look after it. Okay. I've just written down Brucey bonus, which I didn't think I would be. Uh-huh. <laughs> okay. Uh, another one for you, Thomas. If it's okay, we, we're getting towards the end. We haven't got uh, too many more. Um, so what are the potentials for selling a startup before profitability or traction yeah I think there's obviously some really good examples of businesses unicorns you could call them that sort of sell before they make any money something like twitter facebook and you look at those they're you know some of the multiples and and the money those guys were losing was crazy i think to sell before profit i think that's easier to sell before traction i think that's difficult if you've made traction and you can see the profit's going to come down the track and you can get a buyer comfortable that's a different story. 
but I think if you if you're so early on in your journey that you've not I don't know what stage of development are you at if you're not quite finalized your your routes to market or your sales channel that's really really difficult the obvious thing there to do mark is um you partner with a specialist venture capital fund that can put some money into the business help you along the journey both financially and with their skill set to allow you to grow, make it profitable, and then and then look at an exit event. And that would be done by yourselves as well? Yeah, that's something your corporate finance advisor would look after as well. Yeah, absolutely. Fantastic. Um, no, no questions for you, Matt, on tax, which is, I'm not sure that's a good thing or a bad thing. You're looking quite pleased with the fact that that isn't. Well, they could have been difficult. <laughs> but, um, I, as as there's no question, I'll just, I, just when Alan is talking about um, the timing. All I would say is that you, 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 you're typically going to have a trusted business advisor, and very often that's going to be your accountant because they're there throughout. They will be the ones to signpost these things, or should be signposting these things. And it won't surprise people to hear that we work with Alan, we work with Lexington and Tom. And so your accountant should be the sort of the person to introduce these people, hopefully at the appropriate time. If they never introduce these people, then you know you draw your own conclusions. So um, I'll, I won't. I'm glad there's no tax questions. Okay, I'll leave it there. Okay, I could ask you the British Lions captain, but we will leave that one for now. Um, I know that one. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so I guess I'll, I'll I'll kind of wrap up with with where I started really. So I think considerations of business exits. Looking at some of the questions and some of the content we've had today, I think. It's. I think I was right to pat myself on the back for saying it's not the question that's asked by a lot of professionals, certainly in the banking sector. Maybe it's something that some people choose to avoid because it's where do you go? There's not one answer in any one place. So I think signposting to you know the likes of you three guys is is key, and then that collaboration piece after for where do I need. The advice from you know we got Thomas, Alid, uh, and Matt who, who, who can all help business owners and all have a, a different role to play. So um, I think that's a key learning for me today. Um, I will wrap it up there just to um, let you know. One of the questions uh, answered is: Have we got copies of the slides? Yes, we have, and they will be going out. Um, and if anybody needs to contact any of these exceptionally clever people on today's call, um, th their contact details will be available. So, um, guys, thank you, first of all, to the people for joining us today. I hope you found it useful. Um, any feedback is welcome. As the, the, um, the, the food of champions, as I think it was once called, feedback. Um, but thank you all for your time, guys. Have a, have a fantastic day. And um, uh, here's to... Um, meeting up with you next.